Atlanta's Inspiration Station is Praise 1025's Katie Bo Show in the studio. But that dude, and I'm pointing, y'all. Well, yes. If you on video, you can see it. I'm pointing to that dude. It's Jamal me. Jamal Harrison Bryant. How you doing, brother? Man, I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm excited. I believe it, man. You're winning. All right, let's just jump into a couple things. Yeah. Uh, a couple personal things first. Yes. Number one, what's up with the accent? Like, you sound country, but you're from Baltimore. Right. Am I missing something? I don't know. Everybody, people from Baltimore don't think I'm from Baltimore. Yeah. So uh, I was originally born in Boston, uh, but was raised in Baltimore, then came to Atlanta, and uh, then went to Durham for grad school, then lived in Africa for two years. So I got all of that. What part of Africa? In Liberia. Really? Yeah. So that's all the African uh, garb and stuff. Uh, what... Yes, all of that is mixed in my <laughs> mouth somewhere. But people from Baltimore I can't figure out where I am, and people from the South is like, what is this? Yeah, I feel you, brother. Hey, yeah. You sound like you're from the South, and ain't nothing wrong with that. I'll take it. Hey, so when you when you came to Atlanta, yes. I was really excited because the possibilities were, I thought, were really dope. I did feel some type of way that you didn't come to us first. I M- did. Me too. Um, really? Yeah. Tell me about it. Because I didn't know you felt some type of way. I wasn't invited. Stop it. I wasn't. We asked you several times. I I personally called you myself and talked to you. Remember? And, and what happened? You didn't call me back. So how would I remember that? I don't know. You. So how do you know? Phone. I'm telling you. You answered the phone and said what? And you said, "Hey, I'm at. I'm stepping outside of something, but I'm gonna call you right back." And you never called me. Busted. Life happened. Okay, I get it. Life happened. All right. But you got me. What? But it led me to a question. Instead of me kind of being in my feelings, and I was in my feelings a little bit. You know, I talked to Michelle and to Clyde. And oh that. Lord! And it was like, Yo, Jamal's a good dude. I said, I'll, I maybe. You know, I'm, I'm bugging. <laughs> but it led me to this question: How do? Okay, so you went to a secular station first. Yes. Not by default. Yes. I'm assuming it was because that's where the invitation came from. Maybe. Maybe. So that could have been what happened. When I was in Baltimore, I would do nothing on gospel radio. Very good. I'm glad By intention, that. Um, because I wasn't looking for church people. Mm. So people who listen to gospel radio got a church home. Very good. Uh, so the people on R&B and hip hop side, those are the people who I'm after. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's almost like... Uh, your church isn't going to grow from you being on Christian television. Mm. Nobody's watching it but old people and people in jail. So you got to figure out if you're really going to do outreach and missions, go to people who are not open to the gospel and but do the Trojan Christian television as well. I know it, but not primarily. Oh. Yeah. So primarily you do most of your work. In secular. Okay. Yeah. So I do Christian television really not even really to preach, but to push civic engagements and social justice Okay. in areas the church don't go to. So if for 23 hours a day they buying prayer oil and prayer shawls, <laughs> and then I'm coming to say march on City Hall, <laughs> it's going it, yeah, it's it's to it's gonna throw off the whole day. So I'm, I'm a, distru- a disruptor by design. All right, so here's a, here's a direct question, right. um, because I believe the churches want to have that Yes. Sort of relevance as yeah. well, because I think we're going after the same people. Churches aren't just going after church people. Right. By and large, that's what's happened. Yes. How, in your opinion, do churches become relevant so that we can get a person like a Jamal Bryant or yes. a whomever to come to us or yes. to radio stations because they know that we're doing the work? Yeah. Well, every Sunday, whether you're Baptist, Pentecostal or Methodist, here's what we say. The doors of the church are open mm. and we waiting for people to come in and we have no idea the community's waiting for us to come out. Uh, and if we would really get involved and engage in the community, then uh, we wouldn't have to really beat the bushes. Us doing a hundred men in black and a women's tea and a fellowship hall doesn't grow the church. Mm. Uh, but when you're feeding people who are hungry, clothing people who are disadvantaged yeah. and really meeting people at their core needs, they're going to be the door to your path. You know, they told me that we were more alike than we were different. I'm seeing and, that now. And you didn't believe it. I didn't I not believe it. I just, you know, I'm saying my feelings, man. Come on. Yo. I know. Be healed. <laughs> I'm, I'm healed now. I'm <laughs> we got to talk about it anymore. No <laughs> but what I like about it, man, and I, I did need to be healed from yes. my perspective of the church. Yes. Because I felt like it was, as you say, self-contained. All right. How do we, and I see that you're doing it at New Birth. Yeah. And I'm proud of you, brother. Thank you, that. sir. 
But how do we become the churches that are listening to us right now? Mm-hmm. How do we become more relevant? What do we need to do? Yeah, I, I think you got to pick a lane. Uh, the reality is whatever lane your church wants to go into is available. So I don't know if I can say to you right now, what is the lead church in Georgia that has captured black men? Mm. The lane is open. What is the church in Georgia that speaks to single mothers? The lane is open. What is the lead in Ge- black church in Georgia that speaks to the fastest growing STD population as in teenagers is senior citizens. So we giving out condoms at the dorm and they need them at the retirement center. Mm. So I'm saying just pick a lane. There is no traffic in any lane. Mm. Everybody is doing the same space or doing afternoon services, preaching and singing. And we forget that we're called to serve. How did you become okay with that brand of different? Yeah. Because that's yeah. different. And you yes. know, you know, when you're a giant, yeah. people tend to throw rocks at giants. Yes. They, they shoot arrows at you because of that. How did you be okay with that? I, I think because I never wanted to pastor. Uh, I really wanted to. I saw myself occupying uh, spaces like the Urban League, the NAACP, SELC, National Action Network. And God dragged me into this. Uh, I'm a third generation preacher. Right. So it was expected of me to pastor. And so I was a typical PK. Uh, and so I was going against the grain. And so everything that I was doing was uh, really, how can I let the church live outside of stained glass windows? So did you start by saying, I don't really want to do this, but if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it on my terms and I'm just going to do it different. And you found effectiveness through that or? Absolutely. That's why I started a church. There was no church I could have gone to at that season in my life. I started for millennials, for Gen Xers. I was really trying to create a niche church, a hip hop uh, church. So everybody was wearing throwback jerseys and Air Force Ones. Uh, and so for me to make a transition to Atlanta, what more radical church than New Birth? Uh, what Bishop Long was doing uh, wasn't cutting edge. It was the samurai sword. Uh, and so it was easy for me to make that adjustment. Okay. Very good. Millennials, Gen X's, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. What do churches have to become yeah. or be in order to have effectiveness with that younger generation? And I guess the second question to that is mm-hmm. your daughters, man. Yes. They're, they're what, a Gen X's, right? Yeah. Z or X's, they, right? X and Z. X they, and Z. They're coming down the road. So are, are they checking for church like that or, or what? In a different kind of way. Tell me about um, it. So, they have a prayer life. Uh, they are in Catholic school, so they know the word of God. Uh, but they are not as expressive as what it is that I was grown to. But, They'll be shouting in church. Oh, no, no, no. But when I get in the car, they're going to tell me everything about my sermon backwards and forwards. Really? Yeah. So as long as that seed is deposited, uh, that gives me peace. So churches have to do what to be more engaging to you? Here's the reality is that I'm just figuring out from being in Atlanta. This is the first generation that is raised on television that is unscripted. So this generation knows reality television. Mm. Real housewives, love and hip-hop, basketball wives, and the church is still scripted television. So we're still reading from the same script Mm. from 40 years ago. Mm. So the authenticity and the realism is what it is that makes things grow. Uh, And so we're not seeing uh, the church exhibit its brokenness, its flaws, its weakness. We're spending all of our time covering it up Mm. Uh, and not in the words of uh, Shakespeare to thine own self be true. So when the church is able to stand up and say, I love God and I cuss sometimes. I love God, but I hate sleeping by myself. I love God. I take communion, but sometimes I got to wrestle with getting a drink to take the edge off. Sure. When we get to that level of transparency, people will be able to say, okay, God is really for me. You do know, and I know you know this because I've heard you speak about it, that that is in this culture where everything is so fake, reality, spiritual reality, whatever. Yes. That level of authenticity is now different. Yes. You feel me? Yeah. So when you talk about getting men, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We need that because guys, we can see through you like a bottle of Aquafina. It's just natural. Yes. If you're authentic and if you're real, yes. we're going to know. We're going to feel it. Even if we can't put that, 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 we're going to know it. Right. So what I appreciate about you is that even though there was some, what you say, not perf- not perfection, imperfections yes. in yes. the media yes. for you, yes. I never saw you shy away from it. 
I never saw you bob and weave. Right. When they came at you, you always handled it well. Was that because you wanted to be different? Or was that because you just said, no, I'm just, this is what Christianity or relationship with God or reality is? Because my street credibility was on the line. Uh, and so, what, what does that mean? What that means is uh, I went through a divorce for infidelity. Uh, and so I couldn't, in any real character, go in the barbershop and say, the devil did it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Not to do as you can't. No. Right. Yeah, we get yeah. yeah, we're talking about the authenticity of, of right. men. Right. Uh, is that uh, I had to own my own weakness and realize that being saved is not an arrival, it is a journey. Mm. Uh, so people who only give 20-year-old testimonies really don't have a relationship with God. Every day, you don't feel like you're blessed and highly favored. Every day, you don't feel like turning to your neighbor. Uh, so it was like Shawshank Redemption. Some nights I fought, <laughs> some days I didn't. <laughs> you got to come through it. I, I feel I like had, I need to say pause, but yeah, I got you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I had more wins than I had losses. Yeah. yeah. All right, man. So um, uh, just a couple more things, brother. This is good. And we probably just need to could have a, a, a more lengthy conversation at some point. because I look forward stuff. to it. Yeah. Um, so for the person who has weaknesses, mm -hmm. um, what, what, man, what do they do with it? You mean you put it under the cross? Yeah. You, you put it at the, at, under the blood at the feet of Jesus? Yeah. Um, you went in, but sometimes you're not. Yeah. Like how, do you, how, do they, how does the person view that and how do they keep going in spite of it? Yeah, Alcoholics Anonymous has done a better job of teaching redemption than the church. Uh, they teach mm -hmm. that the first step to recovery is admitting you got a problem. Yeah. Uh, and we never want to take admission to what we're dealing with. The second thing is, Katie, if you have not had a drunk drink in 12 years, you are still a recovering alcoholic. Yeah. 20 years yeah. recovering alcoholic. The church gives a false premise. We bring you to the altar, splash oil on your forehead, and expect you to go back and never have urge. Totally different, yeah. Never have temptation, never have a weak moment, because we don't believe in process. See, the church enjoys Paul, but doesn't have grace for Saul. Mm. You got to get through your redemption to get to your finished product. All right, so just this one final question here. Now I got one more after this. Do you feel like you had to forgive the church for anything? No. Not, not the church, not the church. We know what the church is. The yes, call, yes. Get it. But when you were being raised, when you were raised, yes. the idea of the church building, that culture, did you feel like you had needed to forgive it for, for anything? No. Some of the things that it taught you? No. I feel like I, I feel like I did, now that we're talking. Yes. I feel like I did. Okay. And that's another conversation that we All right. probably have. But there's a part of me that feels like, yes, there's some things that I learned and I blame the church for it. And quite frankly, it was like not, what? It's not the church. To be closed and to perform and to act. Yes. And to present a version of myself that wasn't congruent with reality, even though everybody else was, quite frankly, the same as me. Because the church, in large measure, has not really pushed deliverance. We've pushed discretion. And so as long as you don't outwardly show it, uh, and suppress it. So growing up in the church, were you were you were you a Baptist? Were, 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 AME. Okay, so I'm, I'm, okay, so I got y'all might have discretion. We yes. and, and on my side of the church, you got yes. Christ, Holy Spirit. Yes. yes, it was deliverance, and there not was really. no other for me. That's not true. The way they presented it. That's not true. I know it's not true. Now. Yeah, you knew it then. I so did. in your church, in your church, Pentecostal, Kojic, Apostolic, you all preached against homosexuality. Sure. But you all knew who was gay in the choir. You all, yeah, 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 okay. So I'm saying yeah. it was the permissive will of our pet issues. So the, you drove down the street. The Baptist deacons were smoking outside, mm. right behind the van. Yeah, you know what I mean. So yeah. we knew what it was. The old school, your mother's generation, my mother's generation. You got pregnant. You couldn't sing in the choir. Uh, but as soon as the baby came, then we want to have. A blessing over it. Yeah. Uh, so right, we were right, double yeah. dribbling yeah, you're probably right. on, yeah. on tongue in cheek on what we meant and what was our intention. But I had so many challenges with it, bro. I, th yeah. I thought that there were some people who had a level of relationship with God that they could do things and God was like, eh, you know, they put their time in. So that kind of. Yeah. So we, we believe that all have sinned. We believe that scripture sure. for everybody but the pastor.
to all of sin, falls short of his glory. That applies to the usher, the deacons, the nurses, the kitchen committee, hospitality, everybody. You know they don't think. Yeah, right. But if if the pastor makes one slip, I've been pastoring you for 25 years. Yeah. But you find out that I had a drink. I can't listen to this man of God. <laughs> Something is wrong. Yeah. Uh, because we put men and women of God on pedestals, and we don't understand what the pulpit means. Is I'm on a pulpit because I've been pulled out of a pit, and we have transitioned the pulpit to a stage. Mm. And when you put a man and a woman of God on a stage, they become a performer. Man, when I'm on a pulpit, I'm a real testimony of what it is that I've come through and what I'm wrestling with. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. This is dope, man. Okay, final thing. Uh, a lot of pastors are quitting ministry, brother. Yes. Um, what can we do? I mean, what needs to be done? I mean, yeah. or do, do some people need to quit? Yes. And we don't give people the space and the grace to quit. Uh, so you may have a season of pastoring. Uh, but I've you, never heard this before. Yeah, you, know, you may have a season of pastoring, but your your assignment shouldn't be a sentence. Uh, and so you've got preachers who are pastoring. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, God. Wait, wait a minute. You, yes. Your assignment shouldn't be, shouldn't a, be a sin. But there no. are some people that say, I am I'm shackled yes. to, to the gospel. I, You know, yes. that's just my, my calling. I'm and a you, bond servant. And Jesus. you can be a shackle to the gospel. Nowhere does it say you're shackled to pastoring. So your whole life you can preach, but you don't need a microphone to do that. You don't need an anniversary to do that. Wow, and so a lot of churches are dying because they have a pastor who is preaching beyond their assignment. Okay. You are no longer relevant. You no longer have vision, but you got to keep it. Why? Because it's your job. And what does that mean? I can't quit because I have no retirement. I can't quit because how my bills going to get paid? Not because I'm invigorated about what I'm called to do or what I'm assigned to do. Uh, but now it is no longer a place of joy. Uh, it's a ball and chain. Uh, and so yeah. we got to figure out if God called you at 30, should you still be pastoring at 60? The reality is, Katie, uh, both of us know athletes yeah. who are amazingly gifted, agile, uh, and they did a good seven years. And if they did seven, yeah. oh, man, you did that thing. The anomaly, yeah. Yes, if you were in there 13, man, what is wrong with him? Why is he still doing this? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't that he wasn't called. It wasn't that he didn't have a gift. But why is he doing it outside of his time? You, you good. Yeah, you good. Yeah, I see. Yeah. I see. I see right now. I see why you that. Dude. That's, that's, that's some good stuff right there, Doc. Okay. No, it's true. Jamal Harrison Bryant. Hey, man. I love you, bro. I love and you back. I'm really excited about what you're doing here. Thank you. We ain't even talking about why, why you came here. Did you just, just talk? What, oh, what's yeah. up? I Listen, forgot. We ain't even. I, I came because I'm I'm a year late from my invitation. <laughs> All right. Okay. And good. I never called you back. So this is my peace offering. Uh, and I want to just tell everybody, uh, if you're looking for real, authentic, transparent ministry, come to New Birth Cathedral in Stonecrest, Georgia. We only got one service on Sunday morning, 930. That's it. And if you're looking for the best in radio, <laughs> yeah. KD is the man. Say something about me, but you know, oh, I'm yes. to, let me tell y'all. Just they already on your station. They not in my church, but they on your station. Don't eat it all. Share some. I gotta learn how to say this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Jamal Harrison Bryant family, praise one oh two five.